my name is David Chestnut, and I'm here with Alex Jerbeck, who's uh, my colleague. Um, if you've been to these calls before and you've seen uh, Kim and Doug hosting, they happen to be out this week, and so they asked if we'd come in and, and be co-hosts for the day. So so we agreed, and you could think of us as uh, substitute hosts, I guess, for, for this call. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, so a few notes about the community call before we get into it uh, further here. So if you don't already have the invite to the call, uh, that link at the top uh, will get you the recurring invite for the community calls. They're on the second Wednesday of each month. Um, as we go along, uh, Alex will uh, put these links into the chat window so you have them. Um, the uh, next call will be on June 12th, which is the second Wednesday of June. So what the purpose of the call is it's, a, it's an opportunity for folks to, you know, to meet the product teams, uh, behind uh, Office add-ins, uh, the platform, and the APIs. Um, we try to cover a variety of topics in each call, and we typically will try to do at least one uh, technical deep dive in one area in a call. Um, it's a chance for you to see what's new in the platform and what's coming soon. Um, also, you know, it's a chance to do some Q&A with uh, members of the product team. Um, you can submit questions beforehand. There's a form for that, which I'll provide a link to at the end of the call. Um, you can also submit questions as we go along. So feel free to type any questions you have into the chat window as we go um, and as we're doing presentations. And we'll try to get those questions either during each presentation or uh, at the end of each section or perhaps at the end of the call. If we don't get to any questions, uh, you know, like if there's some we miss, uh, we, we post a summary uh, in a few days, Dana mentioned there's a there's a blog post that goes out that summarizes the call, and in there you'll find a, a section of all the questions and answers, and uh, and and we have them all summarized there. So here's the agenda for today. Uh, we're going to do a quick overview of Office add-ins. Uh, Alex will do that. Uh, in case you're new to Office add-ins, just to kind of get you familiar with what the technology is. Um, then later, so Hale is going to cover some new Outlook JavaScript APIs and talk about those. And then uh, Lance Austin from BXB Digital is going to talk about some advanced web techniques that um, you could take advantage of in your own programming. And then finally, we'll have some Q&A. So the uh, presenters today, uh, my name is David Chesta, and I'm a senior dev writer on the Office PM platform team. And Alex Durbeck is also a writer uh, here with me uh, on the same team. Mm -hmm. And we have Sohail, who's a principal program manager on the Outlook team. And then Lance Austin will also be presenting, and he's a software architect and developer uh, at BXB Digital at Brambles. Um, so with that said, let's get into it. Uh, we'll start with uh, an overview of the Office add-ins and um, hand it over to Alex to uh, go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you, David. Yeah, so we're just gonna do a quick overview of what an Office add-in is to ensure everyone's on the same page. Uh, some of you on the call, it's your first exposure to Office add-ins. So we wanna make sure that kind of everyone's starting from the same place. Uh, so first of all, an Office add-in is a Java-based extension to Office's functionality. So at a high level, at a top level review, it's a web app and a manifest file. And that manifest file points your Office host, whether it's Word, Excel, Outlook, to uh, your web service. Uh, and so the advantage of this is that it makes the extensibility cross-platform. So your web app, or so your web app, can be integrated with any sort of platform. So whether it's desktop, whether it's Mac, whether it's online, uh, whether it's that tablet there, all of these things can use your add-ins functionality. And because it is just sitting out there on the web uh, and the manifest file is the only thing that is on a user's client, uh, that means if you need to patch it, then all you need to do is update your web add-in. Your customer automatically gets the update. They don't have to do any sort of download, any sort of update, what have you. Uh, and whether that's you've uploaded your add-in to the store or you've deployed it through your IT admin across your, your business or house. All right, cool. Uh, so next slide. Um, cool, so what can an add-in do? Well, an add-in is a web service, so it can do anything we expect a web service to do. It can make calls to other web services. It can interact with Azure or any other cloud uh, database. It can make calls to the graph. Uh, but for the purposes of this call, we're going to mostly focus on the Office JS library, the Office JavaScript library. This allows your add-in to interact with an Excel spreadsheet, uh, a Word document, an Outlook message, what have you, to use that content and apply the power of your web service to it. 
Uh, and if you'd like to learn more about this or try out Office add-ins on your own, you can head over to our documentation site. Uh, I'll copy this link into the chat in a bit. Uh, here you can find five minute quick starts that'll have an add-in up and running in that time. Uh, you can also learn all about the functionality across every host. Uh, and you can leave your comments there. So if you have any feedback for us, any questions, this is a great source of information and a great way to interact with the product team. All right. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to David. All right. Thanks, Alex. Um, so, uh, so Hale, are you on the line? I am. Hi, so Hale. Hi, everyone. My name is Sahil. I am a PM on the Outlook add-ins platform. And for today, I wanted to provide an update on the uh, latest version of Outlook JavaScript APIs that are in um, progress. OK, so last uh, time in March, we mentioned that we still had uh, some APIs in the requirements at 1.7 that has been officially released that we were working on uh, to implement on the Mac platform, such as recurrence and uh, corresponding events, also an event that tells you when a recipient or an appointment time has changed uh, on a meeting or an appointment. So the Good thing is that we have implemented and those um, APIs are now available on the Mac platform as well. So we have parity for APIs at 1.7 cross platform. Uh, that's one update. And then um, uh, the second update is on requirements at 1.8. If you can move to the next slide. So this was the status we had uh, in March where we were working on a bunch of um, uh, APIs implementing across the new OVA. New Outlook OVA is Outlook for Web. Also, we were still implementing categories uh, and modifying the master categories list at the mailbox level and the on-send event on the um, Outlook desktop, which is Outlook 2016 C2R, which is the click to run build. And then similarly, all these APIs were in progress for Mac. Uh, if you go to the next slide. In May, actually, we have made significant progress across all these APIs. So we have a line of sight for most of these APIs. Um, uh, for new Outlook for web, we are expecting to have these APIs completed by Q2. Uh, so hopefully by end of June, we are thinking that we would have these APIs available in preview. Uh, same goes for Mac. We have actually, uh, we are farther ahead in Mac because majority of these APIs are out in internal dog food, which is the, which means that they are being tested inside the Microsoft tenant. Uh, once we feel uh, and that the, um, the APIs have met our quality bar, we will start rolling out to outer rings, which would be the insiders channel first, and then the uh, prod, um, prod ring. Uh, one specific call out uh, wanted to is that the on send event uh, which is part of the block and send functionality for Outlook. Uh, that's uh, it's available in Insiders for Outlook uh, 2016 uh, desktop. For Outlook for web, it's it continues to be in progress. Um, we are hoping to have that, as I said earlier, by end of June. And uh, for Mac, we are hoping to have that available in the insiders release by end of June. So that's the update from um, uh, our side for the Outlook JavaScript APIs. Uh, just one last thing, I have to drop off um, uh, to go to build, uh, which is a conference happening in uh, uh, Seattle. This is actually one of the uh, biggest conferences Microsoft does focused on developers. So that's another thing I would encourage you. Um, once the conference is over, the content is going to be available online for you to um, uh, view and uh, check out the sessions that were delivered. 
So, uh, so I, I have to drop off, but uh, please post your questions and I will reply back to them um, as part of the black post that will go out after this call. Thank you, Sahel. Thank you. Um, so then moving along, next we have Lance Austin, who's uh, uh, from BXB Digital at Brambles, and he's going to present advanced web APIs. Um, so Lance, let's see if you can take over control of the presentation. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, so like I said, my name's Lance Austin, uh, architect developer at BXB Digital. Uh, we're a Brambles company. You can reach out. You can see me on GitHub or, or Twitter there, um, two places. Uh, I'll, I'll go over BXP Digital and Brambles quickly, because if you want to check out in February, I did a talk and I went more into what we do. But basically, uh, the high level uh, spiel is or the elevator talk is that uh, we connect uh, supply chains um, across from manufacturers all the way to retailers by uh, providing uh, asset tracking devices that go on assets um, that can track location, telemetry, all the different stuff, um, temperature, all of those things. And so we build a, a, a platform that collects all that data, uh, does all the fancy buzzwords, data science and all that, and then provides applications on top of that. And so the Excel add-in that we've developed is one of those that has, um, that I work on and that my team focuses on. So uh, to know more about us, just because we have a lot of content, so I'll kind of go through. Uh, there's a couple slides here as well. Um, so, so back in February when I did talk and when I talked to Kim and Doug, I had mentioned to them, uh, I had two talks that I thought would be pretty interesting. One was the first one I did back in February, and that was a, more the businessy kind of strategic benefits of going with the office JS model um, and why we liked it and why we felt we were pretty successful with it. Um, and this talk is more the technical one and to me more of the thing I enjoy a little bit more. So uh, the great thing about the office add-in model is it's built on the web and since the web has had its, has a lot of challenges uh, to be cross-platform, uh, there's been a lot of smart people that have had to work on standards and building standard APIs into the platform uh, that will give you the ability to take advantage of some of the same features that you probably are used to if you've ever if you've done server development or or just desktop development. And so I wanted to go over a few of those today. Um, it's going to kind of be a whirlwind. Um, I don't expect you to come out of these being experts, but hopefully for folks that are coming from .NET or, or uh, from VBA or something like that, this will kind of make you aware of what's available out there on the web. Uh, for a few people that are new to web development, again, hopefully it just makes you aware of what's there. And maybe if you're having some problem, these are things that you can use to solve those problems. Um, and then folks that probably are already very familiar with the web, um, maybe this will just validate that maybe you're making the right choices or, or if not, there's other people that are actually using these in add-ins and uh, doing it successfully. Um, so to get started, Web Worker. So the Web Worker is really is multi-threading in, in the browser. Um, so it, it allows you to move CPU intensive work off the load. Uh, one thing about it is you don't have access to the DOM. So what does that mean? So folks, again, because so, I, I don't know everyone that's on the call, is JavaScript runs in, in what's called typically the main thread or the UI thread. And the reason why it's called the UI thread, a single threaded application, is because uh, it's the only thing that has access to the DOM. Um, web workers, when you open up a web worker and it runs in its own thread, it cannot talk to the DOM directly. It has to talk back to the main thread and the main thread can do that. So that means if you want to show like a progress bar or you want to add some new items to the list or anything you want to do visually on the DOM, you can't do from a web worker. Uh, but the great thing about Web Workers is that it supports a lot of the main APIs that you, you use typically as a web developer. So things like local storage, IndexedDB, WebSockets, which we'll go over today, uh, Fetch, XML, HTTP requests. You can do a lot from inside there as long as you're not trying to directly talk to the DOM. Um, it's a pretty simple primitive API, and we'll go over that, and I'll show it to you. Um, and the other great thing is it has great browser support. So um, where Office has all the way back to IE 11 and even back further, it has support. So right now today across the board, you can use them. You don't have to worry um, about any kind of does the browser support it, does it not? So it's kind of nice in that sense um, as well. It's, a, it's, it's, it's greatly uh, it's a web standard. It's been out for quite a while. Um, 
One thing also to kind of mention is if you're coming from another language like .NET or, you know, I do a lot of Golang right now in the back end, you don't have to worry about memory mutexes or, or kind of trying to lock memory and all that. Um, as you'll see in the, the API, when you, you go to pass messages between the, the main thread and the worker thread, is that you it actually copies the memory over so there is no worrying about race conditions or people um, making sure you're locking memory or doing all that um one caveat to that there is a way to transfer so if, for folks that are familiar with web workers there is i haven't done it but that gets more down at the binary level so that i will add that as a caveat to that that statement um so to kind of look at the code uh, create an instance of your worker. So all the worker is, is, is a, another JavaScript file. And all you have to do is just create a new worker, provide a path to that JavaScript file, and then store your, your instance of the worker. Next, anytime you want to send information over to the worker and tell the worker, here's some, some data, you just go ahead and post a message to it. It, can be some, it needs to be something that's serializable. So it's not a string, typically a JSON object. Um, it can be a, a low level binary if you're using uh, array buffers or, or typed arrays or anything like that. So you could send that over, but typically um, what I see and what I've always worked with is just sending a serialized JSON object or just a simple text over. And then you can set up listeners, just like anything that's standard in, in browser, you set up on a listener on the worker that says, hey, I want to listen for messages. So you're listening. So when the, the worker wants to send you something, you can go ahead and listen for that event. You can extract the data out, and then you can do something with that. Here, I'm just console that logging it. And then inside my actual worker script, it's kind of the same. So if you want to post a message back to your, your, your main thread, you go ahead and just use the same post message um, uh, method, and it'll go ahead and send the data back. And that's where it would come through on this uh, this message listener. Um, you'll see sometimes referenced in code self. So since this worker is running in its own thread, it's no longer running in window or document. So you don't have access to the main global scope that you typically would. It has its own global scope. Uh, and we'll we'll show that here in a second. And so typically what you can say is self .post message, meaning my local scope and same thing. So this is really it. There are a few other event listeners, but these are the main ones that you would use. So let me jump out real quick and let me run into Excel. So I, what I did for this to kind of show off, I created a small little demo. How are we doing on uh, size here? Maybe I can make it look a little bit bigger and uh, so we could see that. So I've just got this, this little demo here. Um, it's a running in the add-in. Very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say a simple web worker. I'm going to go ahead and start it. And I'll show you the code in a second. So that starts the worker. So in the background thread, there's another thread running. And what I want to do is send a message to it, some simple message. I'm going to say uh, uh, demo, demo web worker. And what it's going to do is in the web worker, it's going to go beep, boop, boop, and it's going to send it back to me. And so that's going to do. And that, that's not that much fun. So that's pretty, and then I'll show you behind the scenes what's happening. But then let's show the power of it. So why would you want to move something to the, the worker thread? Why would you want to move that? Well, it, it might be something that's uh, CPU intensive. It might be something you just don't really care about, like logging or analytic, analytics that you don't want to block your main thread, that UI thread. Um, so what I want to do to show you here is I have this bouncing balls. It's a little animation that's going on. Um, I'm going to put in, uh, say, 20. And what I'm going to do is put it in the first cell here, and then I'm going to click. And I'm, what I'm going to do is tell it to calculate the Fibonacci for this for 20 in the main thread. And then it, what I want it to do is push it in to, to the cell A2. So that did that. So that's, that happened pretty quick. But let's go ahead and jump it up to, say, let's calculate 40 here. Um, we'll clear this just so you can see it. And we'll tell it to do it in the main thread. What you can see here, hopefully, is that hopefully the lag and in, in kind of the presentation, you'll see this, this froze. Your animation froze. You're no longer able to do anything. That main thread is blocked. But if what we can do is we want to do it in the background thread, we can go ahead and click this again. So I'll just to show you that it is doing that. I'll go ahead and click worker thread. And you can see here the animation keeps going. The worker thread was thinking about it, and it went ahead and finished. And so just to show you again the difference there, it, the animation is going, 
worker thread, meaning it's happening in the background on a different thread, and we can go ahead and it does that. So the animation keeps going. The user's not blocked. You can keep letting them either queue some, some information up or that. So to show you a little bit better so you can see behind the scenes, I've gone ahead and pulled up Chrome just so we can see it uh, happening. So when I go ahead and click on Web Worker, I'm going to go ahead and click Start. I'm going to go ahead and uh, go in here to Sources. One thing you can see here, hopefully uh, the text is big enough, we can see the threads. So you can see the main or the UI thread. That's the main where our application. Yep. Quite small, you know, like it is a bit hard to read. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Make it bigger for you guys. There we go. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Oh, it moved it down below. Let me make it wider. And we'll simulate that it's like an Excel. There we go. Is that better? Cool. So, uh, so you see the threads. So now we have two threads. If I go ahead and stop it, um, oh, clicked on the wrong window. <laughs> stop it, you can see it went away. And if I go ahead and start it, it comes back. And we can also go ahead and set, the nice thing is about it is we can go ahead and set some breakpoints on it. So I'll go here on this very simple work, web worker and we can go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and start the web worker. I'll keep tripping myself up by doing that. <laughs> so it's already started. Let's go ahead and send a message. Um, let's just go testing. And we can go ahead and say save. And you can see here it drops right into my web worker. This is a very simple web worker. It's not doing a lot. It's just taking the message, listening for it. It's going to console that log that I received the event. And then it's just going to post it back to the main thread, adding beep, boop, beep, and then putting the data, and then boop, beep, boop. And again, if we go ahead and hit play, we can see also uh, if we look at our global, like I said earlier, it doesn't have access to the DOM. It instead has access to its global worker. And uh, we can see that even in general, it has access to a lot of the APIs that you would want to do. So you could do a lot of different things here on the worker thread. So you can use your fetch API if you wanted to do some crypto or some caching. These are all things that you can kind of do on the background thread. OK. And so I'll just go ahead and remove the breakpoint to show you that. And I'll hit play, and you can see it comes back. Same if I start up my Fibonacci, you can see it started up another worker. So we can have more than one worker going at once. And if I go ahead and double, can I get that to bring? Where are you? Ooh, find you, web worker. There it is. Worker, uh, local host, let's bring it up. Same thing. This is a little bit fancier because you see it's built with Webpack, but we can get around some of that. And let's see. Um, the main con uh, code here is this. So instead of just being regular text data, I'm actually sending a JSON object. I'm checking to make sure it's the type that I want. And this is something I, I had to come up with. It's it's up to you. So the, the API is pretty low level and primitive. So you have to kind of come up with what this kind of looks like and this logic. Um, and I, I just say, hey, ignore it if it's not there. And if it is something, I'll go ahead and create the message and I'll run Fibonacci. So the same thing, I'll go ahead and you can just to show you that it it is actually getting in here when I click the worker thread. I click worker thread. Well, maybe it's not stopping. What's what's a demo if you don't have one bug, right? There it is. Okay, stop down. There we go. Finally. Um, so now it's in there. And uh, you can see here we have ac access to our action. We can do stuff, and then I'll just hit play. Uh, you can see it's still the animation's still going, even though it's it's it's, it's the debugger has stopped it here. So then we hit play, and it goes back and it passes it back. So hopefully that gives you a sense of real quick of what a web worker is. Uh, let me go ahead and go back to the slides. So again, web worker, think of it as multi-threading. You can kind of offload whatever you want. Some ideas that I had for add-in, and this is actually stuff that we do in our add-in, is we offload some of the logging and analytics to that. So we just fire and forget. We fire it over to the web worker and we tell you, hey, web worker, do your thing. We don't need a response back and we tell it to log. We also use it um, for some caching when we want to, we send it over there and we say, hey, do it in the background thread. We don't want you blocking the main, main one. Um, as well as we actually use it quite a bit for offloading our network activity. So in any kind of complex data memory, sometimes you have control of changing your data format at the server, which is probably a better place to do it, but sometimes you don't. And so we do that actually in our background thread 
so that we're not blocking the main thread and the main thread can focus on talking to Excel, especially when we have large tables when we're kind of iterating and trying to pump them in. Um, tips on working with web workers, standardize the message being passed, you saw there, serialize using JSON stringify and JSON parse. Um, some of the stuff I read out there that seems to be the fastest, but uh, obviously doing your own benchmarks. Um, and then just remember to treat this as work as being asynchronous, right? You're sending a backend thread. You have no clue when it's going to come back. You know, have no. You do have to be careful of race conditions. You're, you're not exempt from that. Um, it, so if you've worked with threading, that's something to keep in mind. Um, okay, let's keep going. How am I doing on time? A little slow. All right, index DB. So index DB is a local document storage within your your browser. It allows you to store objects within a key value database. It, it does have transactional support. So if you did want to have actual transactions in there and in indexes, um, you can you can delete and remove items. Um, and it's an asynchronous, but to my opinion, it's really clunky. Um, I, I think the ideas behind index DB are very good, but it's a clunky API and it's tricky to use. Um, so one of my suggestions, and you'll see even in my demo here, I'm actually using uh, um, some libraries out there that that wrap it. There's a ton that do that kind of wrap it, give it a promise-based uh, API. Or if like me, I'm an Angular developer, so I just hap I like to use observables. Um, so it's kind of whatever you want. But it, my recommendation is definitely use a um, use a library. So let's jump out real quick, get back into the demo. Um, we're gonna go ahead and just let's stop these. Go ahead and stop that. Let's jump over to index DB. So what I wanted to do here is show two. So let me go ahead and I'll I'll use the, the de edge dev tools for this one so we can see. All right. So we got the network panel here. Let's go ahead and just clear it. Um, and I'll zoom in. So when I click countries, what that's going to do is it's going to go and this is typically what you'll do is a drop down. You'll you'll say, hey, these are countries. Um, I'm going to go pull it from my server and I have some form and I need to be able to let users see them. If I look back at my window here, you'll see that it just made uh, to this local JSON. Typically, that'd be a, uh, an API, but for this demo purpose, it's just a JSON file that's physically there. And any time I want. Is there yeah? any way you can get just a little bit bigger? When that window pops up, it's just a yeah. little hard to read. Let me see what I can do with Edge. Yeah, they let me do it too. All right, cool. Oh. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for letting me know. OK. Um, so every time I do that, and that's the way it's done, and that's typical, and usually you'd probably store that in memory somewhere and it just sits sit there. So as long as the application's open all the time, then you're good. It's, it's going to be nice. But the next time the user goes back to the application, countries typically aren't going to change a lot. So, you know, that's a good opportunity to say, hey, can we cache that? Can we put it somewhere? Well, that's where the index DB comes in. Um, and let me go ahead and click this. And when I'm loading there, that very first time, this one is, I went ahead and loaded. And just to kind of tell you what's happening there, doing the same exact thing. And we'll look at that network request in a second. And then I'm storing it in index DB. I'm saying, okay, go ahead and store it in this index DB. And then the next time the user comes here, I don't. I just want you to pull it directly from index DB. So you can see there it's much faster if I go ahead and just leave my add in, and I come back to it. Um, and which is typical of a user that's using add-ins, they're kind of opening them. They're they're doing that a lot. We wanted this to be fairly quick. So right there, instead of having a two-second delay like I've done for the server fetch, just to kind of simulate it, that came up pretty quick. And so the reason that is, is that we can let me go back over here did i oh i closed it yeah let me go ahead and refresh uh refresh that's right attach make sure we're there um what we can do is i'll go ahead and do that we'll just open that we can see it does if we look here at my dev tools you'll see there is no network request that was made but if we go to storage and we take a look in our storage we can see there's this index DB, CC demo, I call it, and it's just this list of caches. And I'd use a key uh, of countries, and then I just store the big array of values that's in there. And so I can access this whenever I want. And, and what I can do is provide like a better um, um, kind of caching experience for users, which will make your add in, again, try to feel that user experience like it's a lot faster and a little less like a web app um, running in the context of there. 
So that's index DB. I did, I'm not going to go into the syntax because that would take a while because it is kind of that. My recommendation though is look out there. There's tons of libraries. All right. So that's index DB. Um, again, ideas. Um, one other way things we've done with this is seeding demo data for our add-in. Um, we actually, uh, when we build our, our part of our build step, we check if there's a flag in one of our, our, our configuration files to say, is this demo mode? And if it is, we go ahead and we seed uh, the, um, we, we load some scripts that'll be at the beginning of your startup of uh, this add-in. It would have gone in and loaded a bunch of data into IndexedDB for us so that then our sales team, when they're out doing demos, they can kind of have a fresh live system that's of demo data. Um, again, caching of drop downs is a great idea. And even potentially if you want to support an offline mode, um, you could do this in theory. You could be tracking, talking to the uh, Excel API, tracking maybe some changes or, or, or collecting those up so that maybe when the user gets off the plane, they can say, hey, go ahead and sync these changes that I've done. Um, again, I've my biggest tip for it, find a library that's out there. The one I showed in here, I'm using this key value, which kind of treats it like local storage. And there's a ton at this URL link as well. All right, so let me keep going. Uh, WebSockets. So a WebSocket is just a bi-directional TCP connection between browser and server. Uh, typically, what you do in a web application is you um, are used to being able to make HTTP requests to some API to get data to either send data or receive data. Um, maybe if you've come from, again, from a, a desktop applications or server applications, you've maybe been familiar with connecting directly to um, a server uh, directly or, again, or back to your database. So you maybe used to be and have that kind of direct connection. Um, a WebSocket kind of gets you there. Um, the nice thing about it is it uses HTTP to kind of first make its initial request to start up the, the WebSocket. And then after that, it does what's called an HTTP upgrade, and it upgrades it, and it just reuses that TCP connection. So it's kind of nice on um, typically a TCP connection out of your, your, your um, network is going to be blocked uh, by your IT, uh, your firewalls, but an HTTP isn't. And then it, since the TCP connection is already available, it can reuse that connection. Um, you can send low-level binary data across it, or you can do serialized text data. Great thing, it's available in a web worker. Um, it is a simple primitive API. One thing, though, I do want to call out here, if you go down that route, again, it does not implement any kind of authentication or authorization. Um, that is up to you as the implementer, or even, again, if you're using some framework that's out there, server client side like SignalR or, or um, in the .NET world, or if you're a Node person, the Socket.js, um, or even, for me, Golang has its own right in, in the uh, library. Those you have to kind of implement. Um, and there's, it's not like HTTP where you have a basic header or you have typically have cookies and some of these other things. Um, it is something that you have to deal with on your own. So I did want to make sure I bring that up. Um, again, great browser support, Office support, as well as web standards, because everywhere that Office is right now has access to these web APIs and it's available in the web worker. All right, so let's jump in and show that one off. All right, so uh, WebSockets. So again, I got my bouncing balls uh, side to side just to show some kind of animation. We're going to calculate the Fibonacci doing exactly what we did before. The same thing still holds true. If I if I go ahead and keep this at 40 and I pull it out of a cell A1 and I click the main thread, it's going to block it and it's going to go ahead and and and, uh, and 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 make my animation stop. But what if I wanted to send it to the back end server and tell the server to do it? One way you could do that is make an HTTP request and wait for that HTTP response to do that. Um, so that's that's obviously a good pattern. We do that all the time when we do that for things. Another way to do it is you can start up a WebSocket and you can have direct real-time connectivity with this there. You can constantly be sending message to the server or receiving. And so in this case, instead of telling it to calculate the Fibonacci here in uh, in this in the main thread here, I want to sell it, go, go calculate the Fibonacci on my socket server. In this case, it's my local PC here, and I'll show that in a second. So if I go ahead and click WebSocket, you can see it doesn't block the thread because it's an asynchronous thing. It's happening. If I open up VS Code here and I pull up my little windows here, you can see there that I received the 40. And if uh, let me maybe make that a little bit bigger, no. Let me go ahead and let's just change it to 41, and we'll go ahead and. Uh, 
click WebSocket again. And if I pull up my window, you can see there it received it. It's calculating it. It went ahead and calculated it and it sent it back to the server. So that's the great thing about a WebSocket server. So you can have this real-time connectivity um, uh, where you can offload some of your work, even if you don't want to do it on your uh, web worker, you can go ahead and offload it on the background. You also have really deep control over how stuff's sent. So let's go ahead and open it in Chrome so we can see it a little bit better. Um, if I go to my network, you'll see here, let me go ahead and clear this. Let me go ahead and refresh WebSocket. I'm going to click on WS. And we can see I have this localhost one. This is WWSS, so I'm using WSSS. Let's go ahead and look. Um, you can see here that it made an HTTP request uh, out. So HTTPS localhost 4200. This is all the browser kind of takes care of a lot of this, and I'll show the, the code for that in a second. And it, and it goes ahead and it responds with this upgrade. And if we look at the messages here, we can start seeing the messages that get sent. So I'm going to go ahead and send. This is me sending 40 to the background thread, and that's calculating. Again, if I go look here, 40 was sent, and I got that. So we can send any kind of arbitrary data. Here I'm just sending numbers. This could be large JSON objects. It can be kind of whatever. You can do this in your web worker as well. Um, so you can be accessing your web worker, getting data from your WebSocket, putting, pumping it into XPV, sending it over to be written into Excel. These are all different things you can kind of do that are pretty powerful um, features. So let me jump back into my slide. Am I doing on time? Okay. Yeah, plenty of time. Okay, cool. So um, I kind of got ahead of myself with showing the demo, but <laughs> so so just like the web worker, um, it's pretty pretty basic, the API. So new WebSocket. Um, WSSS is is the instead of HTTP and HTTPSS, you have your protocol is um, WSS or WS. Um, so my recommendation obviously is to make sure you're using transport level security on this. Um, and you just give it your server and then some endpoint that knows about that upgrade request. Again, if you're using socket JS or Signal R, they take care of a lot of this stuff for you. Um, but at the low level, this is what you as a developer would have to do. Um, to, to be able to open a socket. Um, so the socket's open. Um, you can listen. There is an event handler that listens for open. Um, uh, and and uh, I'll show that here in a second. Uh, you send data just like similar to the web worker. Instead of post message, you say send. Uh, here it needs to be in a it needs to be a string, a serialized JSON object, uh, an array buffer, um, a typed array. Uh, binary data. So if you wanted this transfer images or, or something like that between the web worker, uh, you could do that as well and keep it low level. Um, and again, you set uh, once you've got this this instance of socket, you can go ahead and add event listeners just like you would typically in, in web development. Uh, there are some other stuff like on air, on open, on close. Um, the one thing about WebSockets is it opens that connection, it keeps it there, but maybe the server disconnects it or you disconnect it because you close. Um, so you do need to add some logic in there about retrying, reopening um, in there. Again, the standard web API doesn't provide those, but a lot of the libraries do. So again, SignalR, OpenSocket.js, uh, uh, whatever your favorite WebSocket framework is. Um, so to me, the, the, some of the things that this really offers in the, in the context of add-ins is real-time connectivity with your server. So if you're used to having that, and maybe you've had it where you had a user that had to VPN in, they had to connect directly to a server um, within their, uh, their data center, this is a way that you can have that similar experience uh, through, through WebSockets that you would expose. Um, you have more control over how data is sent from the server to client. That, to me, is what we needed. Uh, one of the things that we do, we have large tables in our add-in. Uh, we have about anywhere from 200 to 500,000 records uh, that users will want to download with like 50 columns because uh, people love their columns in Excel. <laughs> so um, to get the performance that we needed uh, and to kind of control how the data is written and how big the chunks are, how, how often the chunks are, we actually use uh, WebSocket so that we can control the size of those chunks. Um, 
ideally in the in in modern probably more once now that we're to edge in some of these more modern browsers we could use fetch in the streaming abilities of fret fetch and it already handles throttling but unfortunately because of ie 11 we can't do that you only have xml http request um so using their kind of streaming progress events is an ideal for large large data sets um uh, so, so we couldn't really use that. So for us, WebSockets were the answer for that. We were, we were able to control the chunks that come over, how big they are. We're able to kind of throttle them. And then we try to choose, we kind of queue them up so that Excel can kind of decide when to grab it. And the other thing we do is we add this to the web worker. So it's definitely something you can do. Um, you could also, if you needed to communicate between the dialogue. So, you know, the API today in, in Excel and in some of these office, the dialogue that pops up is, is not you don't have direct access say to the worksheet but one thing you could do is send which we don't do today but you could in theory um set up a websocket server that you let the user in the dialogue put in some input and then it would go back and search the worksheet and then send it back through so it would kind of be like a relay that would go through the websocket so that's something that you could do um some tips on it again uh tls do WSSS protocol, so make sure you're using security. Um, be sure to implement and read up on authentication and authorization in WebSockets. Um, for example, with ours, what we do is we have a 30-second window where you have to authenticate yourself and, and provide us with, uh, with authentication credentials, and that's one of the messages that we require you to send over the socket. Um, if you don't, we go ahead and on the server, we just close the connection. Um, there's other things I've seen where people have called APIs where you get a one-time use code and you then send that over, which then kind of verifies that you are that person. Um, there's You kind of kind of look at your own, but it, it is one of those things that you have to implement yourself or hopefully your library does. Um, and then standardize your messages that you're passing. Um, Again, uh, I, I, our application, and this just works for ours, but uh, however you guys write your own applications, we follow a Redux pattern. So we already have kind of a mental model of sending over actions, um, dispatching actions. We already have this mental model. So we kind of treat that same idea of sending stuff to the web worker and sending stuff to the sockets that everything has to have a type and everything has to have a payload. And then based on the type and payload, we will handle it as, as such on the server or in the web worker. So that would be my recommendation on that. OK, so service worker. Um, many of you probably heard this whole PWA, progressive web app, service worker um, kind of buzz that's over the last year. Um, what is it? It's just like a web worker in the sense that it opens up in its own thread. It's its own standalone JavaScript file that's run. And really what it does is it acts as a network proxy and it runs in the background. So this is how web applications are able to give you today like background syncing, give you notifications like pop up notifications. Um, and it also allows you to kind of control the caching. So the network that's what the network proxy part of it. So you, the, the this this script can run and it can intercept any of the fetch APIs that any kind of X, like HTTP requests that are being made. And so it can say, oh, well, I already have this file, so I can just load it from my cache cache storage. Um, so what that's going to do is it offers a really closer to native experience where it can really start up your, in our case, our add-ins fairly quickly, um, and. Uh, one caveat to this, though, and my last bullet point there is it's not supported in IE 11, but with the recent Edge being released um, into the latest and greatest uh, Office for um, for Windows, it will be supported. Uh, so, so going forward, um, you will be able to. So you will have to have some logic in place so that if it is IE 11 or an older browser that you could that you need to kind of or even older older Safari then you need to be able to handle that. But going forward, this is gonna be very, um, very promising. So let me just jump in real quick. Uh, we won't go over the code just cause that would itself, again, uh, all the internals of the code kind of like IndexedDB could take hours, <laughs> long sessions. So what I wanna do is just jump right into a demo of it. Um, so let me go like this, let me go, yeah, let's do that. Um, so here's my, my first one. I had this call community demo. What I'm going to do is just go ahead and click on service worker. What you're going to see here is it's going to 
Let's make sure I got my web server going. Uh, there we go. Okay, it is going. So we get our, our our web server going. So it's the same web application. So it's all working basically the same. And we can go ahead and just say uh, testing beep bop boop. And we can go ahead and hit send. So nothing fancy there. But what if I just go ahead and really quickly uh, kill this web server here and simulate as though we were offline? If I go ahead and click refresh, see if the demo gods are with me. You should go ahead and start up in the applications going. So if we go ahead and I just to show you that it is, if I go ahead and uh, let's hit security info, you can see HTTPS localhost uh, 4300. So that's my localhost 4300, which is what's running here. My localhost 4200 is my main one. So what you saw there is this is working without the web server being, and that's because the service worker is running behind the scenes and it's checking and it's saying, hey, do I have this, this index.html? Do I have this JavaScript? Do I have this CSS or already cached in my local me memory? Um, and it's not using what your, your standard web uh, server caching, like the no cache header and all that. It's a separate cache and I'll show you here in the Chrome tools. Um, but I can still use this application. I can still go, all right, send. I can, uh, it's working. Beep, pop, boop. No. Nope. <laughs> yeah. Try again. Stop. Start. Yeah, we got. May have an error. So let's see what's going on there. What? No, we don't want F12, do we? We want this one. Let's just see real quick. Can not attach? Oh, because it's not right. Okay. It says it's running. So I'm, hmm. Well, we'll keep moving. But what you can see here, just to show you, because I'll show you the rest of the demo, um, we can see that it, it's it's registered itself as a service worker. It's running. It'll update in the future. We have cache busting and all that, so it'll actually cache bust it when I make changes. Um, I can choose what I want to. So these are kind of implementation details. Uh, the API itself does not provide a lot of these. It just literally it just re gives you the ability to kind of register these service workers and do that. So um, let me jump into Chrome so we can actually see what's going on here. So if I go ahead and change this again to 4300 instead, um, which let me go back to here. Now it's telling me that it doesn't exist. So why is that? Because it hasn't uh, created this, the server. So I'll start my server. I'll go ahead and tell it to reload. And now uh, let's go ahead and show all. You can see all of the stuff that's coming through. Oh, uh, let me clear this. Let me clear that. So we can see here is all my scripts coming through. Uh, index.html, localhost, localhost. But then you can see these ones that have this little this little cog there. And so this is the service worker starting up. Um, this is kind of Angular's implementation of it, um, but yours would be something similar. And it's pulling down all the different files, workers, and it's going ahead and caching all these. Now, when I go ahead and click re refresh, uh, I'll go ahead and click reload. Now what you're going to see here in this size is it's going to say from service worker. So no longer did the index.html, office.js, some of these things come from uh, the server. They come from the service, the from the service worker cache. And so if I go ahead again and I kill this uh, little window there and I tell it to refresh again for me, you can see there again it pulls from there. And I have this this application that's working offline. I'm not having this to touch a, a server and it's working. Now, you, this is where that's why I showed index DB and some of these other things is this coupled with index DB where you maybe pre-cache some of the data, you would have access to those data and you could store changes, you could do all these things so that later when you're online, you can do it. The other great thing about these service workers and kind of what they offer is that they then can be added as your app, actual application. And that I want to underline because that's one of the things I love about the Office JS and added model is that it's web development. So we're actually in the progress right now of extending our current add-in 
that will be context aware of knowing, am I running in the context of an Excel add-in or am I just running as a web stand standalone web application? And if I am, then I should be able to install it because I have a PWA. And so what you're seeing here, and let me go ahead and pull all this stuff down, is an actual application that I've installed to that. So this is a PWA, what they call progressive web app. It's installed, it's working there. Um, I can click it off there. You can see it has the Angular, so that's the default logo. It's just like an actual application. It runs with the, the actual Chrome kind of, or not the Chrome, but the uh, Office uh, UWPA or UWP uh, kind of border here. So it feels like a native application, but it ends up being my, my, um, uh, my web app. And if I go ahead and hit refresh, you can see there it's fairly quick. It's pretty instant. And same thing, if I my, my web server is not running here, and this is just loading from the cache. And so I can do stuff like this. I can say web worker, start Fibonacci. Same thing, I can tell it to go on the main thread. It still blocks. Uh, and I can tell it to do in the worker thread. Here it is, it's not talking to Excel. It knows that I'm not in the context of Excel. So instead of writing it to cell A2, it's writing it to the, the window here. Um, so that's so just, yeah. just a quick time check, we'll, we'll need to wrap up soon. That, that was it, that was the last little demo. So, <laughs> yeah. so that's my last demo on that. So just to kind of finish up here, sorry, I apologize for the timing. So I said it was gonna be a whirlwind tour of these APIs. So again, cash resources for faster startup times. You could could do notification background syncing, um, even in the context of add-in. And then it also allows you to, like I just showed you there, you could have this progressive web app that can be installed directly to, to Windows, um, same with uh, Android and all that. And it can be, the same application can be used as your Excel add-in. Um, so it allows you to kind of reuse that development work that you've already done, as well as providing the experience that you want pending on where the user wants to access your application. Um, so tips on this, research and read up on the challenges because caching is hard. It's, um, uh, I'm fortunate there's a lot of, I, I happen to be an Angular developer and the Angular team's thought hard about this and they've come up with some good solutions for it. Um, pick your framework. I'm sure there's solutions out there or if you're someone that likes to roll your own, just research, make sure you read up on it because uh, there is quite a bit to it. You don't want to leave yourself in a, somebody with a cached old state of your application. Um, and that's what that would be. So. Again, uh, just to summarize, web worker equals multi-threading, index DB equals local object store. Um, so if you need to store stuff, if you're wanting, if you need bi-directional TCP connection, WebSocket's something you could, should look into a little bit more. And then if you wanna be able to control kind of the caching and background processing and kind of uh, this PWA, progressive web apps, um, slash just in general to, to control kind of the network a little bit more, uh, be sure to read up on service worker. All right. So with that, David, sorry for the coming up on the time there. I'll hand over control to you. And no worries. I, I think we'll be fine. Um, let me share. Well, I had your slides in mind. So uh, I really like that uh, demo with the, uh, the bouncing balls and stuff. It's a really great way to show how those things worked. So thanks for that, Lance. Um, so I just want to say, like, if you're interested in engaging with us on the community call um, and you want to do a presentation like Lance just did, uh, there's a form you can fill out and we have a link there for the AKAMS Office Add-ins Engage link. Um, just fill it out and reach out to us and we'll get in touch with you to uh, set you up. You know, if there's something interesting you've done with the Office Add-in uh, add platform or the JavaScript APIs and you want to share that out, uh, that'd be fantastic. Just uh, let us know. You can also provide feedback uh, about the docs using the same form. So if you have ideas or suggestions to make the doc experience better, we definitely like to hear from you. Um, let's see, quick Q&A. Let me see if I can bring up. Hopefully this is showing my notepad. So we had a few questions that came in on the form uh, before the call. Um, I did want to talk about this one. It said the breakage of the make EWS request async and Outlook for Mac clients has been extremely painful for, for us and our shared customers. Um, and so uh, folks are asking if there's an update. And there's this issue that's actually tracking it. Um, and if you go take a look at it, it's um, the Outlook team has been working on that for a while. I did reach out to the Outlook team yesterday to try to find out some more information. 
Um, they recognize that, yeah, this is a it's a pain spot because, you know, it's something that was working and now it's not working for some folks. Uh, it's being really squirrely. So they're doing research into it um, and it's a top priority for them. They said that they should have some more information, uh, you know, in, in the next day or two, basically. So I would say keep an eye on that issue and uh, see what they say there. Um, somebody also asked, what are the best Excel add-ins, the best Outlook add-ins? Um, on that one, I'm going to reach out to the product team and see what sort of opinions folks have, and, and we'll post some responses to that in the blog post in a couple of days. Um, and then somebody was also at wondering, what's the exact date to release the Edge Web View Control for the public? And uh, that's another one. That question just came up this morning. So that's another one I'll need to reach out to the team to find out more information on, and we'll post an answer uh, in the blog follow-up. So, uh, and, and Dan, this is Lance. So I, I'll uh, I'll also I will push this repository of these examples that I showed uh, to GitHub, and I'll share that link with you. See, so you, you guys can add that to the blog post as well. Okay. Yeah, that would be awesome. That would be great to share that code out. Um, real quickly, some developer resources we have. If you want to learn more, uh, there's a series of links here to documentation to getting set up on the developer program. So. Uh, we'll post the slide deck as well in the blog, so if you need these links, you can refer to that because I'm moving pretty quickly. Um, and then there's some engagement links, you know, if you have questions, uh, where to ask on Stack Overflow and so on. Um, finally, just want to say thank you to everybody for participating and listening, and thank you to the presenters. Uh, great presentations today. Um, a recording will be available soon on Office Developer YouTube. There's a link there to uh, Office Dev YouTube. We can see this call as well as previous calls if you want to go check them out. The next call, as a reminder, will be the second Wednesday of June on June 12th. And uh, here's a link to the forum uh, to submit questions. So if you want, if you have questions you want to uh, have addressed uh, in that next community call, just go there and submit them. And finally, if you need an invite to the community call, there's a link there that you can use to get that added to your calendar. So once again, thanks everyone for participating uh, in the community call and we'll see you at the next one.